to begin then, uh, let me say the following. It's no longer, uh, I think, uh, uh, it will no longer surprise anybody, so to speak, to, uh, to, note, uh, to note the point that the uh, unrest that began to sweep the Middle East in 2011, uh, initially misnamed the Arab Spring, uh, has not led to uh, more representative or more uh, rational forms of governance in our region, sadly, uh, to disappoint many of the expectations that many of us had. Um, it is nevertheless, in my estimation, uh, possible already to draw a pattern, uh, to note a pattern, so to speak, behind these events and to look at the uh, results five, six years on and to say the following, that what the Arab Spring, what the regional unrest has in fact very notably and interestingly produced is the effective collapse of a number of long-standing, once strong Middle East states. And it is this reality of state collapse, which in my estimation at least, is the key and salient uh, process currently taking place in our region. Countries which we may, as Israelis, have, been, have had problems with, antagonistic relationship with, but countries that we thought we knew the measure of, that we assumed we would be dealing with for many years to come, have effectively, as a result of the tremors of, resulting from internal unrest, uh, ceased to exist. And it is this reality and the war among the ruins taking place, so to speak, among many of those countries today, which defines much of regional uh, reality and much of regional challenges. There are, of course, exceptions which uh, prove this, prove the rule, so to speak. And in this case, uh, that's a particularly apt phrase. There are two countries that have faced serious unrest in Arab countries in the recent uh, half decade, who nevertheless have come through the unrest intact, at least as countries. One of these is Tunisia, and the other is Egypt. You know the stories are in huge detail. Obviously, the Arab Spring beginning in Tunisia with the bringing down of the long-standing dictatorship of Bin Ali, and then elections taking place, the Muslim Brotherhood Associated Party, or Nakhda Party, winning the elections, subsequent elections taking place, and Nakhda losing, agreeing to go home, almost uniquely in the Arab world, or, or perhaps even uniquely in the Arab world, the party that loses an election, actually agreeing to vacate government as a result of that. And therefore, in Tunisia, the first possible signs of, uh, of, represent, of something resembling representative government, and in Egypt, even a much better known story, you know, un unrest against Mubarak, Mubarak is brought down, elections, Muslim Brotherhood win the elections, and then July 3rd, 2013, the epoch-making, in my view, history-making military coup of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the military back to power. But the point is, in both cases, all this unrest, all these tremors, all these uh, difficulties, take place within the framework of strong states, with strong institutions, strong histories, and strong national identities. And at the end of all that, Tunisia is still there as a recognizable entity, and Egypt is still there as a recognizable entity. But these are the exceptions that prove the rule, because in Syria, and in Iraq, and in Yemen, and in Libya, and in Lebanon in a different way, and I would argue also the <coughs> Palestinian Authority uh, in a different way, Internal unrest has led to the effective collapse of the, uh, of the state in question. Syria no longer exists. Iraq no longer <coughs> exists. And what is taking place on the ruins of, of, of those countries, or the area in which that country once existed, is that uh, various successor or would-be successor entities, usually organized on a sectarian or ethnic or in the Libyan case, tribal basis, are, uh, are making war among the ruins. And the collapse of the state, it seems, has taken down also the not particularly well-developed national identity which that state claims to represent. What is a Syrian today? What is an Iraqi today? Where can you find them? Very hard to find them. But you can find in Syria, if you spend time there, plenty of Kurds, Kurdish patriots and fighters, plenty of Sunni Muslims, Arab, Arab Sunni Muslims, plenty of Alawis, etc., etc. The component parts of these states have come back into the picture and making war for the future with one another. Well, I could spend a great deal of time uh, describing the process in each country of how this transpired, and if I had more time, I would, but I don't. So what I'm going to do is, people want to ask him questions about a particular country, I'm going to focus on it. But I wanted simply to lay down the, the broader picture, first of all, of what is taking place in our region, the 
collapse of states and war among would-be successor entities. <laughs> now, it is important to note that these conflicts in Iraq, in Syria, and so on, are not taking place in a vacuum, and they're not taking place in isolation from one another. It's not that you have a unique closed system of Syrian conflict, a unique closed system of Iraqi conflict, and so on. There are crisscrossing lines linking the conflicts, that's to say, alliances between various of the players in each of the conflicts, and more importantly, there are also efforts by strong regional states to benefit from this process through the sponsoring <coughs> and support of various players within the various countries. So what I want to now turn to do is to look at what these state-led alliances are before going on to look at what they mean uh, for Israel and also for the West. In this regard, it is uh, vital, first of all, to note and to examine why it is the case that the strongest single uh, alliance or block in the region today is the one led by Islamic Republic of Iran. And it is the easiest one to, to, uh, to denote, so to speak, to note who are the friends of Iran in each context and how they are operating with Iran's help and how does this benefit both Iran and the, uh, the, the party in question. And there's a reason for this. And this is crucial to understand. And the reason is because Iran is a very different kind of state to every other state in the region, because Iran is a revolutionary regime. And to say that is not simply to, to speak in rhetorical terms, rather this has practical instrumental implications, because Iran possesses, because of its nature as a revolutionary uh, regime, policy instruments and agencies not available to any other state which are uniquely useful, uniquely suitable for the period of chaos in which we are currently situated in the region. In the Islamic, in the form of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, and most specifically its elite uh, Quds Force, Iran possesses an agency whose specific task, a body of men, whose specific task is the creation and sponsoring and support of proxy political military organizations whose uh, raison d'etre is the furthering of the Iranian state interest in various countries across the region. Now here's the thing, in normal times, possession of an agency of this type might well have very little meaning. You know, in good times, where states are strong, and they have strong security services and strong institutions, the fact that one regional state chooses to create and, and finance an agency whose job is fomenting revolution in the neighbors could be seen as a ridiculous conceit or a little more than a decoration. Okay, so Iran wants to have revolution. But when the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps try and stir things up in eastern Saudi Arabia, and they do, or in Bahrain, they rapidly collide with a powerful state, with a powerful security apparatus, and the thing comes to very little, usually. But in a period where states have collapsed, as I described a moment ago, and where successor entities are rising up out of the ruins to do battle with one another, based on ethnic and sectarian identity, the possession of a body like the Cods Force, with its 30 years of experience in this kind of work, is worth its weight in gold. And if we look at the process whereby Iran has uh, created and supported its proxies and sponsors, its proxies uh, and agents uh, in Syria, or in Iraq, or in Lebanon, over the last five years, we see the way this works. For example, in the most tangible form, in late 2012, Bashar al-Assad, the long-standing client of the Iranians, got into serious trouble. You can perhaps remember that summer of 2012, I spent part of it in the city of Aleppo in Syria, so I remember it very well. It was a time in which the rebellion in Syria looked to be driving on ahead and, and driving out, driving out all the city before it. There had been bomb attacks deep inside the security compound in Assad in Damascus. His, uh, his uh, cousin, Asif Shalkat, head of military intelligence, had been killed. His brother, Maher, had been badly wounded in these bomb attacks. Mm -hmm. Worse, from Assad's point of view, the rebellion had driven into Aleppo, the second city of uh, Syria, and looked to be taken in soon. Assad had a real problem. His problem was the absence of manpower, the absence of uh, men, not sufficient numbers of men, willing to take a bullet for him. The Iranians looked at that situation and uh, came to Assad at the end of 2012 and said, look, your problem is you haven't got enough men to take a bullet for you. We've got men who can create a new army for you. And that's exactly what they did. And they created a new 
light infantry formation, or lightly armed guerrilla style formation of the kind the Iranians are good at creating, called the Jaish al-Shabi, or Popular Army, the National Defense Forces they call it in English, and they put 40,000 lightly armed, well-trained young men, Syrians, Alawis by sectarian loyalty, through training and into battle in the spring of 2013, and we saw that that, at least for a time, reversed the military situation on the ground in Syria. Just an example, there are many other examples of the way in which the Iranian their proven abilities in this kind of warfare, this kind of insurgency, counterinsurgency warfare, uh, is, a, is a massive asset for the Iranians. So the Iranians are looking at this region uh, like a chessboard, and they have players in various parts of the board. And when a player, when, when the knight gets into trouble, so to speak, on one side of the board, they're able to move assets across the board in a very effective way to help him out. They can bring Hezbollah into Syria when Assad has problems in Syria. They can bring Hezbollah into Iraq to train Shia militias who stopped ISIS's advance on Baghdad in the summer of 2014. The RGC, Revolutionary Guards guys, can go to Yemen to train Ansar Allah, the Houthi militia, as it drives, as it drives southwards with the intention of reaching the strategically crucial Bab al-Mandeb Strait that controls maritime traffic from the Persian Gulf through to the Suez Canal, etc., etc., etc. They're playing a very sophisticated game. They have agencies and tools well versed in the necessary skills to, uh, to advance their interests. Um, if we turn from the Iranian side in this context then to the other side, to the Sunni Arab side, uh, largely over the course of the last uh, half decade, the situation has been not quite as well organized and not quite as, uh, as optimized. The Sunni Arabs have found it very, very difficult to come together and what we've seen, if you try to look at the, the lines of support, for example, to the Syrian Sunni rebels from the Sunni Arab states, rather than a clear and discernible single line you have on the uh, Iranian side, you have a bewildering, crisscrossing network of lines of support, often interfering with one another, of the different clients of different Sunni states, clashing with one another, and so on and so forth. Um, we used to divide up the Sunni side of the line into kind of two blocks. We used to say the Saudi Arabia and Sisi, well, that's easy in Egypt, that is, who are more sympathetic to Israel and to the West. And then we have Qatar and Turkey on the other side, more sympathetic to the Muslim Brotherhood and political Islam. The new Saudi King Salman has suddenly blurred those, uh, those definitions because he's trying to have a rapprochement with Qatar and Turkey and political Islam. Interesting development, to some degree worrying from our point of view. We saw that Khaled Mashal of Hamas was uh, the welcome uh, guest of the king uh, in late June uh, in Riyadh. So some degree worrying, but also this rapprochement has been interesting in making the Sunnis a little bit more effective in recent months than they've been any time over the last five years. I'm sure you've been reading about the troubles that Bashar Assad is having in northern Syria right now with a new rebel alliance, the army of Congress, Rashid Fatah, pushing ever closer into his heartland in Latakia province in the west of the country, uh, example one. Example two, I'm sure you've also seen the way in which the Houthis, Iran's allies in Yemen, have had their advance stopped in Yemen, have not reached Aden, have been driven out of Aden City, not reached Bab al Mandeb because of Saudi air intervention, and latterly, very interestingly, a ground intervention by the Army of United Arab Emirates, who one might have assumed would be something of a joke army, and as it turns out, they're nothing of the kind, they've been doing rather well in recent days. So as soon as getting their act a little bit together, but the general picture there, as opposed to the Iranian situation, has been one uh, largely of confusion. A couple more points before I just want to go on to the implications of all this for Israel. I mean, just another two processes to note, so to speak. One, of course, is that on the Sunni side of the line, there are, of course, manifestations and projects which are not supported by any Sunni state, or at least not openly and not in a comprehensive way. And the most notable of these is the Islamic State, uh, ruling now over an area roughly the size of the British Isles, uh, obliterating the old border between Syria and Iraq and ruling over between 9 and 10 million people. A um, couple of points about this Islamic State entity. We read about it a lot in the media. It is, of course, a barbarous and murderous and criminal affair. But it's not uh, just a bunch of crazies, and this is important to know. Uh, they're currently ruling over around 10 million people. They've already put in place a primitive system of administration which deals with the daily needs of those people in terms of water provision, food provision, and so on and so forth. There's a, a basic, rough and ready, but existing uh, administrative system called uh, Wilayats, they call it the Wali, uh, 
guy who runs uh, you know, these particular areas, said divide it up, the Islamic State into. The point to understand from all this is simply to note the Islamic State is not going to be uh, destroyed by its own internal contradictions. These guys are very much in control of the area in question, which leads me to, to note that they're also not going to be destroyed by bombing from the air. So the coalition uh, bombing campaign uh, in Iraq, which of course in Australia right now is a discussion of whether you guys should extend your involvement in it also to Syria, uh, it has undoubtedly helped in containing the Islamic State, at least to the north, east and south, where it's going to, they're still expanding in the west. Um, but it's not going to destroy it. And this is something which needs to be considered and thought about when you're considering your policy options. And you stop the Islamic State, but since President Obama declared his intention to degrade and eventually destroy the Islamic State, that's not going to happen from the air, and that's something that needs to be understood. Islamic State was another issue I wanted to mention. The other one I wanted to mention was that in these collapsed spaces of the Middle East, we are also seeing the emergence of minority non-Arab or non-Muslim communities organizing themselves effectively for the first time to some degree. And the most notable of these, of course, is the, uh, the Kurds in both Iraq and in Syria, two very different <coughs> Kurdish projects in Iraq and in Syria. In Iraq under President Masoud Barzani, a tribal, conservative, pro-Western, sympathetic to Israel, uh, pro-business uh, project, with which Israel, of course, has close under the uh, under the radar relations, and in Syria, no less fascinatingly, an area, expanding area, ruled over by the Syrian franchise of the PKK, a very different uh, Kurdish nationalist project which emerged from the uh, Turkish radical left in the 1970s, with all that goes with that. And these are the ones who have the women, the very effective you know, women fighters, and so on and so forth. That you've, I'm sure, come across in the media. So the Kurds and others also organising in the ruins of all this. And lastly, the last component of the picture I want to put in, uh, manifest in all this, is the strong sense that all players have that the West is kind of absent from any of this, that the Americans don't really want to be part of any of this, that the, when they do get involved, it's a grudging and minimal involvement, and therefore both would-be friends of the West, like ourselves, like Sisi in Egypt, like the Jordanians, perhaps like the Gulf Arabs too, and also would be uh, enemies of the West, the Iranians, Hezbollah, the Shia militias, ISIS and the others, share that perception that whatever it is that's going to be sorted out in our region, whoever's going to win, whoever's going to lose, it's going to be something largely that is sorted out as a result of the actions of the players themselves and not those of Western powers intervening to organize an alliance on this side or on that side. This is a new reality to a certain extent for many of us, and this is, uh, this is the situation we're dealing with. Lastly then, uh, for the last few minutes, what does all this mean uh, for Israel? Well, of course, on one level, there's a, there's a beneficial <coughs> aspect to Israel from all this. You know, before 2003, as I said, before the Western invasion of Iraq, which destroyed the Saddam regime, when uh, visitors would come to Israel, they would ask spokesmen, uh, what are the main conventional threats facing this, or actually, what are you worried about? People would say, we would say, well, you know, there's two very large conventional armies ruled over by regime, by very brutal and hostile regimes that seek our destruction. One of them is the Syrian army, or Hafez Assad, the, the father, the much more capable father, who died, of course, in 2000. The other is uh, the Iraqi army of Saddam Hussein. And our deepest fears with regard to conventional warfare, and it's conventional warfare that really kills people, not these small wars. We remember 2,500 Israelis killed in three weeks in October 1973. That's what a conventional war looks like. Um, you know, our deepest fears are the Syrian army rolling over into the Golan Heights the way they did in October 1973, or conceivably the Saddam Hussein regime pushing westwards, pushing through the flimsy defenses of the Hashemite monarchy of Jordan, and menacing our very long and hard to defend eastern border. Well, it will not escape your attention that as a result of the events of the last decade, neither of those armies exists anymore. Indeed, even the states that supported them don't exist anymore. And one of the heads of those armies is now dead and buried there after being hung on the end of a Shia rope, so I was saying. And the other is, is, is hiding for his life, running just 20% of the territory of his country, or Bashar Assad. 
Um, but so far, so good from an Israeli point of view, of course. But uh, the new confused and chaotic situation brings with it new challenges. Challenges in the form of uh, paramilitary organizations, both Sunni and Shia variety, who may be fighting one another to the death. They are fighting one another to the death. In Kalamun, in Syria, in Zabadani, in these places, ISIS locked in a death struggle with Hezbollah. But when it comes to the issue of Israel, they agree. Israel must be destroyed. Indeed, not only do they agree, but quite amusingly, if you have a, a black huge sense of humor like I have to have to remind you, quite amusingly, if you look at their propaganda, the Hezbollah propaganda, the ISIS propaganda, they spend a great deal of time, each one of them, accusing the other one of being an agent of the Zionists and of Israel, going into great convoluted detail as to how and why this is uh, undoubtedly and obviously the case. From an Israeli point of view, then, it's threats from both sides regarding these new forces emerging. The, uh, there's a dispute or a discussion in the Israeli system as to which of these is the more uh, dangerous threat. But the, the side winning the day in that discussion, so to speak, very conclusively up until today, are the people who, correctly in my humble estimation, consider that it is the Iran-led regional bloc that remains by far the more formidable threat to Israel. Not because its ideology is any more extreme than that of the extremist Sunnis, they're on a similar level, but because its capabilities vastly outweigh those of the more florid, uh, primitive Sunni Islamist projects. And for this reason, if we look at the direction of Israeli policy over recent years, we can see but when, as we're told by foreign sources, Israeli jets bomb into Syria, they do so to stop weapon systems going to Hezbollah from, uh, from Syria, from Assad regime. When Israel develops relationships with some of the rebels in southwest Syria, of the most pragmatic uh, kind, the reason is very clearly to stop the Iranians slash uh, Assad slash Hezbollah from being able to organize a new line of attack against Israel just east of the Kunetra crossing, so just east of the Golan Heights. They've tried hard to do that. Israel's been determined to stop them. And Israel has been willing to treat with, so to speak, rebels down there who don't have a good view of Israel at all, of course, but who for pragmatic reasons are willing to work together with Israel on that basis. So uh, you know, the, the second to last point I want to make is to say that out of all this chaos, the Israeli view remains nevertheless clear that while Sunni, Jihadi, Islamism undoubtedly is a threat and means us ill. The most urgent threat at the moment is and remains uh, that represented by some Republic of Iran, its Revolutionary Guards Force, its Quds Force, and its various uh, agents and, uh, and proxies uh, throughout the region. Just finally, a couple of more general remarks as to what all this uh, may mean for Israel, so speaking, we're not moving on to the longer term. Ultimately, it is important to note that all of this unrest in the Arab-speaking world is part of a larger process. And that process is the crisis in which the Islamic and Arabic world have had what one might call a terrible or terribly problematic encounter with modernity. As modernity has come to the Islamic and Arabic world, instead of producing more representative institutions and economic development and social development, it has produced clashes and disaster with the uh, Arabic-speaking world trying its hardest to get its head around the fact that it's no longer as advanced as the Western world is, with the terrible sense of humiliation that comes with that, with the desire for revenge against humiliation. Now, all of this is a process to which we are neighbors in Israel, but of course we're not partners to it. Our only encounter with modernity, problematic as it uh, sometimes can be, and I'm a resident of Jerusalem for the last quarter century, so I know about some of that, but our only encounter with modernity is a largely happy one. That's to say, our institutions are functioning. The national loyalty of our soldiers, to put it mildly, is not uh, in doubt. The, the viability and durability of our democratic institutions and of, of our open society are not in doubt. Which means that ultimately the task facing Israel in the period ahead is one easy to state, harder to achieve, of course, but easy to state. And it is effectively to, to uh, fence off, so to speak, our own successful project from the, the maelstrom uh, burning all around, blowing and burning all around us. In the immediate sense, that means hard security measures along the borders, and these we have put in place, new fences, surveillance, video equipment, investing in new military units, investing in intelligence, and that's working. And in the 
medium to longer term, what it means is the development of new alliances and new friendships across the region. And this I'll conclude simply by saying, here there's, there's good news. Because amidst all this chaos, uh, there are forces who, for their own pragmatic reasons, have plenty of good reason to have good relations with Israel. And if we look at the way in which Israel's relations with the Sisi government in Egypt have been built up uh, over the last few years since its inception, or Israel's ongoing close cooperation with Hashemite monarchy in Jordan, or many years' duration, of course, but very much even stronger in recent years. Israel's under the table, good relations with Barzani in Iraqi Kurdistan, the close and developing relations with many Gulf states, the United Arab Emirates, and Kuwait among them, perhaps Saudi Arabia, the most uh, notable. We can see the way in which Israel, as a strong and capable and functioning, if threatened, state in the region, um, is able to turn that into diplomatic capital as well in the creation of important uh, new friendships. So we're in for a, a rough ride, so to speak, in our region in years to come. Having said that, I think we can say with some confidence that the ship in which we're taking the ride, so to speak, is a durable craft, not really down to much of our, to our credit, but rather to the credit of those smarter than us who came before us. But we have a strong, durable uh, craft in which to navigate those seas, and I'm confident that we'll come through it uh, successfully. On that uh, optimistic note, I'll be happy to conclude and to take your questions. Thank you very much.